So we do a SWOT analysis and then we do goal setting. So we do that in a, in a really interesting way. So then we're working backwards. So a lot of times it's like, okay, we want to, we're at 3 million. What we want to be at 10 million next year. So what do we need to do? Here are our problems. Here's where we want to go. Then we come in and create a custom plan of this is your action step. We break it down for each week over the next year. This is what you need to do to get there. It's so male dominated, right? Yeah. The sales and team should, be, I don't know though, because one thing I'm dying to do, and I'm actually, I'm actually interested in having an all female PA podcast. Mm -hmm. We need more female public adjusters. Personality assessments to um, even like work style preferences. Do you prefer to work on a team or by yourself? Do you like the fast paced environment or a more steady pace? So just figuring out, you know, what people value and how they prefer to work is invaluable before someone gets on the team. Everybody on my team takes the culture index mm -hmm. and the strength finder. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, like we think we know what the issue is, but it's actually not the issue. Most of the time we're seeing like the symptom rather than the cause of the issue. Right. So that's where we start off. And so I just go through, that's why I give them an assessment about your organizational health. Meet these roofers, meet these restoration contractors. Mm -hmm. If you're a roofer, meet the fellow roofers. Like it's just so much fun to talk shop. And if everybody's pretty laid back, I had a great time. It was my first time. So rather than waiting till stuff falls apart, you know, we're catching it really early and they can have targeted support on them. I mean, when you think about like innovation, we don't like roofing is not like the most innovative industry here. So mom and pops, outdated technology, that's kind of where roofing is, it's really lagging behind. So I feel like, you know, the quickest way to, to growth is bringing in different skill sets into your company. That's why I like to do the strength finders assessment. Ah, that's the one I was gonna get to eventually. Yeah. So after I worked with them, it's like, if growth is really your thing, we need to invest in a training program. We need to get together and have meetings to talk about innovating our processes. So whatever your core value is, then you build your hiring, your training, everything around and center your team around the processes. What's up, advocates? And welcome back to another episode of the Claims Game Podcast with your host, Vince Perry. Uh, first, before I get into our amazing guest that we had this year, or this year, this week, sorry, um, we had basically, uh, we've got, we're sponsored, right? Awesome. Sponsored by Fortez Health. Fortez Health is a PPE company where they sell all kinds of PPE, right? Obviously, COVID, mold, all kinds of stuff. They sell great, great, great equipment, KN KN95 masks um, at a really good good price and all kinds of other stuff that you may need. Face masks, half math suits, like the whole nine. All right. And the good part is that if you watch this show or listen to this show and you put in code VINS20, you get 20% off. So give it a shot. Fortezhealth.com. Also, when you buy anything, money is donated to the people, to the frontline workers uh, for COVID. So I think that's pretty cool. Today, we have a very special guest, okay? It's a guest like no other. The only guest I could say that's a little bit similar is when we did uh, an interview with Eric Wang earlier this year. Uh, he's uh, He was basically like a business coach. Well, this time we've got Jessica Stoll, and she's an actual doctor. She is a psychologist, and she specializes in helping roofing companies. That's just what she specializes, uh, her specialty is. And the reason is she's got a great story about her father and the stress that he went through owning a roofing company. Uh, so that's the reason why sort of she's got such a passion for what she's doing. And she's trying to give back to really mainly the roofing industry. Obviously, she branches out into other businesses as well, but she's a business coach. She's also a psychologist, and she's also very, very interesting. Um, like I said, she is a doctor, uh, organizational psychologist. Um, she basically specializes in scaling contracting companies by building systems and teams that align with their company goals. She is an international published researcher, author, coach, and university professor. Professor, Her methods are proven to double company revenue within one year, decrease turnover by 20%, and increase sales ratios by 17%. 
That's impressive. Throughout this whole interview, I was impressed. Also, let me tell you, it's the first time we did a live interview, okay? So it's not Zoom. It's not anything like that. We actually did it in person, which was really cool. Um, and shout out to Startup Street, who allowed us to use their uh, their, to use their facility to actually film it and to record it. You can find Jessica Stahl. Actually, her phone number is 615-419-1746. And you can actually find her on social media on Facebook at, at Ignite Results, YouTube at Ignite Results, and LinkedIn at Ignite Results. So she's easy to find, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, you know, without further ado, oh, and by the way, she's also a country music singer. She's going to hate that I actually said this, but she's actually also a, cute, a country music singer and she's got a YouTube channel too there. It's called Jessica Stahl Dash Topic. Don't tell her I told you. Anyway, it was great synergy, fantastic talking, fantastic conversation. We had a lot in common and a lot that we didn't have in common. I mean, she's really got a cool story. I think you'll like it. We had a great time, so enjoy this with Jessica Stahl. Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. All right. Okay. So we are here. Uh, we are here with, uh, this is a very special time because we're here, not only because we're here with Jessica Stahl, but this is the first time that the claims game live, claim, I'm just so nervous. I can't even say it, that the claims game podcast is live and in person. So Jessica, welcome to the first live claims game podcast. Welcome. This is awesome. I feel like a celebrity over here. First time live. Shout out from Tampa. Yeah, so we're here live in Tampa. We're actually here. Thank you to Jeremy Griffin. Uh, he's the owner of Startup Street. And Startup Street, it's like right here. What's the name of this road? It's like a super- Swan. Swan, yeah. So it's, I mean, we're like right in the heart of almost downtown. I mean, we're not that far. The traffic is ridiculous because we have the yeah. uh, Super Bowl. Super Bowl, oh my gosh, I'm excited. Just to get here, besides the fact that I moved to Lutz, <laughs> it, it, it was like 40 minutes just to get here. <laughs> Are you going to the Super Bowl? No, I'm not going to the Super Bowl. Are you going to the Super Bowl? No, no, I'm not going. I am going to a Super Bowl party, though. Are you going to a Super Bowl party? I'm going to two. Oh, yeah. two? Yeah, I'm oh. just saying. Oh, well, excuse me. I had to make some appearances. Look at that. Make some appearances. I like it. You know, uh, you are kind of a celebrity. Maybe. What people don't know about Jessica, and maybe we can get into it later, but uh, Jessica is like a a famous uh, country music singer. Well, I wouldn't call me exactly famous, but <laughs> I'm a singer songwriter and I put out a record a few years ago. So I'm more, I call myself a living room singer. That's, so that's, I like to, you know, perform in either the nursing home or my living room. It's more low key in those locations. In the shower usually, right? Singing. Yeah. But that's not what we're here for because yeah, it is no, the no. claims game podcast and i do like to talk about all kinds of stuff but what i really want to talk about jessica has a really cool story uh jessica is the owner of ignite results and ignite results and i, I obviously would prefer well tell me about ignite results you tell me yeah so we're a consulting firm and we specialize in helping roofing companies scale so our main mission is to make companies profitable and fulfilling at the same time so we work a lot with business strategy, helping people understand their why, their mission, vision, values, and then putting a team in place. It's so important because I think people are too too busy just like work, 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 mm -hmm. sign, 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 mm -hmm. contracts, contract, contracts, build, 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 next job, next job, next job. And what I found interesting about you is that if you focus just on that and if you're focusing just on the money, you get you get very stressed out and mm -hmm. things usually don't go the way you want them to. You, you get too caught up in the work itself. You forget about the fact that you have a family. Mm -hmm. I actually did a video today on, on Instagram and I went, before I was here, I went to go help my friend move. Mm -hmm. He came from Tampa. I mean, I was picking stuff up, going three flights, this guy, of all places, he had to go three flights up. And I did a little video after, because I've said it a lot of times, for me, I've tried to always keep my focus on, and it's in order, in this order, Friend, uh, family first, friends second, health third, and then work. Mm, I will mm -hmm. always put those three things in front of work. I just think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. So what I like about you and what I, the reason really I, why I have you on here 
besides the fact you're a very interesting person, <laughs> is your story. I think your story is, is fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. so, so tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. So I grew up in this tiny town outside of Nashville. People are like, oh, Nashville's the big city, but it's a tiny town about 15 minutes north of Nashville, one stoplight. You know, people are excited about prom. We had Tractor Tuesday. Everybody's <laughs> driving their tractor to school. You know, I think your tractor sexy is like the whole theme song of the county. <laughs> and so this this really tiny town and my dad has always been in the trades so and it's always been a family business so we were in ac and plumbing um then roofing and so i have five brothers wow (laughs) yeah only girl so wow yeah Yeah. so if that might need to explain a few things um yeah i love all my brothers what was what was that like growing in a house with did you say four brothers right five five brothers and you what was that like (laughs) Yeah, so we're, there's an age gap in between, so I wasn't in the house with all of them. Um, two of them are stepbrothers. So, I mean, I took karate because I kept getting beat up. So I started taking karate when I was like eight years old, and then people were scared of me. Yeah, you must have known how to defend yourself, that's for sure. I can't imagine the fights going on in the house. It was so bad. Yeah. But, you know, that's I feel like... You know, we use everything to our advantage to get ahead. And, you know, growing up with five brothers, you have to be really tough. For sure. So, and growing up on a farm. Yeah, so that's how I grew up. And then... (laughs) I want to ask you so many questions. And the reason why you and I were talking last night, you and I come from such completely different backgrounds, it's not even funny. Besides the fact that I'm also an only child. So I don't know what it's like to grow up with all that with all five brothers and sisters, uh, five brothers. Uh, But I'm from the city of Miami, you know. Mm -hmm. What is it like to grow up on a farm? Please tell me. Yeah. Like how much work does that really entail? It's a lot, right? Yeah, well, it was more of a family, it's a family farm, so it's not like we're doing a bunch of like crops and everything that goes along with that. It's, we have horses, chickens, ducks. Um, We have a parrot that my mom taught how to dance. And we have a pig that lives in the house. Okay. He's supposed to be 40 pounds, but there's a mix up, so he's about 220. Oh my goodness. Yeah, my mom's like, I think you should move back home. I'm like, no, no. uh-uh. It sounds no. more, instead of a farm, it sounds more like a zoo. It's a circus, that's <laughs> what we call it, yeah. How loud is your house, just curious? Well, it gets really loud when everyone gets animated. Yeah. So. But between the people and the animals. It's a lot. Thanksgiving, it's like my whole family comes in, they're wild. Um, <laughs> like literally they're just wild just so wild yeah and the pig lives inside the house yep he sleeps on the couch and <laughs> he has his own room mm-hmm. i've always had a dog but i never had a pig yeah well make sure you get like some good recommendations it's supposed to be they're like oh yeah 40 pounds Mm-mm. right no yeah but now he's already in the house so he's spoiled i can't believe that all right, so that's you, where I started from. Right, so that's where you started from. Okay, uh, how did you get to where you are now? How long did you live there? Uh, how long did you live with your family? And then you've been, you're living here on your own now, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I left for college when I was 17, and I was in school for 10 years. Mm-hmm. To that's okay. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I did uh, went from undergrad all the way to my PhD, and graduated with my PhD about six years ago. And so I lived in Nashville in between semesters and and I spent a lot of time there. And then I moved down to Tampa to be, and I worked at Publix at the headquarters here. So as you know, that's one of the best companies to work for in the US, like well run. I specialized in building culture and the hiring processes there. So all my education is like from number one university and working in Publix. Wow. So it's like, okay, why am I in roofing? <laughs> like, yeah. that's the big question. Right, exactly. How did you get to roofing? I'm confused. It, but wait, real quick, is that why there's so many Publixes here in Tampa? Yes. It's like every five minutes. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, that's just okay. So now next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love them. They treat their employees wonderfully. Do they? Yeah, and that's like they put their people first, and that's why they're so successful. And they also, I know, in the Publix is here. I don't see it as often, but I saw it in Miami a lot. They have the special needs children that mm-hmm. work there and doing the bags and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, here in the West Chase one, I remember too. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, what I like about Publix too is every time I go in there, everybody's like, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help mm-hmm. you? Can I help you? So it's pretty nice. Yeah. It's like when you want people to have great service, it's like it's service starts from the top with its leadership. Right. Right. So. And what were you doing for them exactly again? I'm sorry. I was helping to build culture mm-hmm. and to, I ran the hiring processes. So building out custom hiring processes for hundreds of positions, leadership from all the way from bagging groceries to um, the new CIO. Uh So being able to work with the company to identify the exact candidate that we want and put a process together to screen people out, to hire the best person and to make sure that they fit with the culture. Now you said you were building culture. Mm-hmm. I feel like that sounds vague, but what does that what does that exactly mean? Yeah, so I mean, and th- I get a question about this a lot, you know, what is culture? Right. But culture is really everything. So most often you can point to the environment that you work in. Is it a friendly environment? Is it a motivating environment? But it also is, you know, how do you reward your people? How do you what factors do you look for when you're hiring? So the place where you start for all of that is your values. So your core values, that is how you define your culture. So when I'm working with, a, with roofing companies, you know, one that I worked with is, they said one of their core values is growth. But then I look at what they're doing in their company and it's like, that is not actually what's happening in your culture. So after I worked with them, it's like, if growth is really your thing, we need to invest in a training program. We need to get together and have meetings to talk about innovating our processes. So whatever your core value is, then you build your hiring, your training, everything around and center your team around the processes. Is growth considered a value though? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Would it? So your core values, it's something that the way I define it is your core value is something that is more important than money. Okay. So oftentimes your values, according, like you have your values and they help make you profitable. But if there's ever a decision in question, you're going to go with your core values. Right. So oftentimes if your core value is service, it's like, are you going to use your customer to make a few extra hundred dollars? Or are you going to go back and, you know, clean the nails out of the rose bushes? So your core values in your culture is something that you stand behind even when stress hits even when you know you have really hard decisions you're falling back on those core values as your guide to make all your decisions and did you find I'm, and i'm guessing you learned a lot of this stuff while you were obviously you're a phd so that's mm-hmm. very impressive right there uh well, your your time with Publix must have been an amazing learning experience yeah huh? absolutely did yeah. you deal with a particular or a particular area or was it nationwide it was nationwide so wow. Our department handled, you know, 200,000 positions. So from how do you instill the culture into people that just get hired on? Right. And so Publix does an amazing job about onboarding their people and getting them super excited about the culture from day one. In the hiring process, you have to make sure that these people understand that before you even hire them, right? Right. Is there something in particular that you're looking for uh, depending on the culture? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, some of the things we do is we're asking targeted interview questions about their values. And then we also give them structured assessments as well. Gotcha. So, personality assessments to... Um, even like work style preferences. Do you prefer to work on a team or by yourself? Do you like the fast paced environment or a more steady pace? So just figuring out, you know, what people value and how they prefer to work is invaluable before someone gets on the team. I know a little bit about the assessments. 
Mm -hmm. Do you, when you do the interview and you ask these targeted questions, uh, do you ever find, is it, is it just sort of, don't you, is it a little redundant when you're asking these targeted questions? Because when you get the assessments, that's going to also give you a lot of the answers too, right? So I think it's like, the way I see it is like building a case and oh. gathering evidence. So you want to build a case for why you're hiring someone. That's what we do as public adjusters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you get it. You want all the evidence possible. Absolutely, yeah. So you're seeing on gotcha. You know, a test, someone's got great leadership. In an interview, someone's got great leadership. You get references, great leadership, and then you build the case to hire that person. Gotcha. So before the hiring begins, do you need to establish the culture first? You know what I think of when I think of culture? What? You're probably not going to think about this. I think of the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. Are you a sports fan at all? Some sports. Okay. I okay. like the Bucks. Yeah. The bu oh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> be in the true. Super Bowl. So. so, growing up in Miami, I was always a Miami Heat fan. And anybody who's listening to this who's from Miami knows exactly what I'm talking about. And they talk about culture all the time. Mm -hmm. And what the Miami Heat have been able to do, and it's sort of like the Patriots too, something similar. You know how the Patriots are just always winning? It's sort of the same thing with the Heat. And it starts from the top down. Mm -hmm. It starts with the owner, Mickey Arison, who the, also is the owner of Carnival Cruise Line. Uh, but then the general manager is Pat Riley. And they always talk about this culture, this culture that they have. And that no mm -hmm. matter what team that they have, everybody has to buy in. Mm -hmm. And if they don't buy in, they're out. Mm -hmm. And their culture is just mainly, we're going, to, we're going to outwork you. We're going to outwork every single person. And what they do, as soon as they start, as soon as training camp starts, it's like wind sprints wind sprints it's sprinting mm -hmm. it's sprinting and you have to be in the best shape they check your body fat they check your diet they check to make sure that you're in good shape that you can do all the running you can do mm -hmm. all this and that and a lot of guys that go in there i.e shaquille o'neal back in the day uh he did win a championship with us thank god but after a couple of years he was out mm -hmm. uh, we had another guy just recently his name is hassan whiteside also kind of lazy out mm -hmm. you know and but it just when you say culture it, it makes me think of that how it, once the culture is established i think it, it's much easier to hire people to make sure that everybody's sort of fitting in right yeah so and then i mean it's also if the culture is not what you want and everyone mm. is on board with that how do you change it so that's that's one of the things we specialize in is you know where are we at as a culture and where do we want to go so does that mean we need to change the mindset of leadership is it you know it's never the solution to just get rid of the whole team because the team is not the problem you're just going to hire more people and that's not the actual issue it's always a leadership issue and people learn bad behaviors from the top exactly what you're saying like with the coach and the owner what's the difference now working with roofing companies which is on a much smaller scale mm -hmm. than Publix, right right so what's the what's the biggest difference that you're encountering i guess it's how do you deal with the if the leader is the owner of the roofing company how do you deal if the issue is the owner how do you deal with that the issue is always the owner <laughs> okay <laughs> so that's not like it's not like oh man but there's i mean any type so my philosophy is extreme ownership so if there's any issue within the company it always starts at the top that's a great book by the way yes yes <laughs> so <Jocko. laughs> it's like but you can't really say that when you start working with a client. So I just give them an assessment. So just an objective assessment. Let's measure everything that's going on in here. Let's let's measure, you know, how the productivity of your people. We're going to look at your turnover rate. We're going to look at your financials. We're going to look at all the processes you have in place from start to finish. And then I don't ever say you're the problem. I just hand them the data. And so it's like, these are the, the few issues that are here. So what do you think is the problem? And, and that's really why it's consulting and coaching is because there's always gonna be issues and the owner's always gonna be involved, but having that person buy in and really wanna grow, that's the only way we're gonna make a real difference. So you're taking, you're doing the assessments and you're showing them the numbers and you're showing them the facts. Exactly. Yeah, it's like, let's dig into your numbers. Let's go through. Um, and one of, the, one of the metrics that I always like to work with is because it's like, oh man, like our salespeople are terrible. And so- Take ownership, man. So it's like, <laughs> like come on. let's go through your numbers. And it's like, with the company I worked with last year, it's like, you're losing the majority of your salespeople at 30 days. 
So what is happening? What is the issue there at 30 days that most people are dropping off? And that was like when the when there was no more training. So there's training like the first two two weeks, some support, and they completely would send their people off into a different location where there as where there was no leadership. I'm like, wow. So if we want to make this work, we need to provide some additional support at 30 days. So their turnover rate has dramatically decreased just by making small changes. What like did you that. do? What was the change? So the change was to, because there was no weekly meetings at this point. Okay. So one of the first things we did is have weekly sales meetings by Zoom. So just having that face-to-face -face contact, getting it off the phone, because every salesperson's calling into the manager, you know, checking in every once in a while, but having a team meeting on Mondays about how we're gonna accomplish the week and having the people in the field with more accountability. So making sure they're, they're utilizing their CRM to be able to track and run different reports to hold the sales team accountable. So rather than waiting till stuff falls apart, you know, we're catching it really early and they can have targeted support on that. Is it, yeah, you can't use the CRM? Is it like, is it your like objections when you're closing? Like what, what is going on there? But at least some communication is obviously very important. Yes. One thing I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if you run into this a lot. One problem that I've always had in the past, me as a business owner, is I tend to, I think it's very important to make sure you hire like other managers. Because mm -hmm. I think, and I don't know if you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, as a business owner, we, we, we try to, we're, we're involved in every single thing and we have to be involved in every single thing. We have to touch everything. We have to have that one-on-one -on -one with that person. We have to know what's going on mm -hmm. with, I think, I think it's on the contrary. I think for one, that's just extremely stressful. It's going to drive you crazy as a business owner. As a number two, you need to hire those people that next level management, right? Mm -hmm. Who could run all those people. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got involved in my dad's company. Okay. So my dad's owned uh, Music City Roofers in Nashville for 10 years. And so the company was just really stagnant around the 3 million mark. And, you know, we increased just a few percentages over the years, but it was really just stuck. And so, and my dad was so stressed out. There's no family dinners. There's no vacation because he doesn't trust anybody and nor should he because the hiring system wasn't right so right. we've got people stealing trucks we've got inappropriate office behavior on caught on camera which is a whole <laughs> another thing right but there the problem is is that he didn't want to let go of control that's that's the problem and that's and it almost killed him so and that's really why i'm passionate about what i do is because my dad ended up having a stroke and it could have been fatal so like the stress that hit from business um if you you can only handle that for so long either you go out of business which a lot of companies do or you die or you die which and you're thinking about heart attack the suicide rate the depression the alcoholism it's super high in roofing right so and a lot of it is because the company's not run right or you get so you make so much money at the beginning it's like oh wow we lose track of who we are so i think it's like it it's super important to that's why it goes back to your core values of what's really important and then when you're looking to hire leaders you're going to hire leaders that also care and and that's really what makes the company is having the right leadership and also having the right systems so when you're not there the business can run itself and your your dad stroke strictly stress related yeah totally that's crazy what was it like working for your dad oh god and him having to listen to you and tell hey uh buddy you're not doing this right <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it, it's interesting like after you have a crisis like that your willingness to listen is like, well, I mean, your credentials are there, right? So at right. least there's that. Thank yeah. God for that. Because if it wasn't for that, he would have been like, what do you know? <laughs> I know. It's, I know that he, he definitely values me and my education. I think it's hard to transition from, you know, being this daddy's girl to 
and now coming in with a PhD trying to fix the company. But it really was a family effort to find leadership, to put the systems in place. And that was a lot of growing pains that took place. And it's really, we had to make a lot of it financial investment at that point too. Right. So it's always going to be an investment. You can either like do things the wrong way and burn yourself out and go through employees that are going to bezel from you and then put systems in place. Wow. Or you can get your education up front by bringing in a consultant like myself, getting mentorship within the industry, and get your education up front and not have to waste three years and millions of dollars on things that don't work out. I'm a, I'm a public adjuster. I run a public adjusting firm. A lot of public adjusters are out here listening to this now, and they're just like, yeah, we've got a lot of public adjusters working under us. Uh, there's a lot of roofers, I think, out here listening to this now and just being like, oh, man, I've got all these issues and I've got all these problems that I'm dealing with, and I don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. What's sort of like the what's the process that you go through I guess just the first couple steps that you do uh, when you first go to a company and you're just like all right um, here's what we're gonna do like what's some of your processes when you do that yeah so I think the first thing is to look at the data that's that's what it always is because most of the time like we think we know what the issue is but it's actually not the issue most of the time we're seeing like the symptom rather than the cause of the issue right So that's where we start off. And so I just go through, that's why I give them an assessment about your organizational health. So just even like getting some metrics to... to What are are the assessments? Can I ask you? Yeah. So, I mean, the assessment that I'm giving up front is something that I created. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So that's one of the things about like getting your PhD is we specialize in metrics and consulting. And I was a stats professor at Clemson. So being able to have those numbers and digging into the data up front, that's that's the only way to do it. Wow. Um, I want to know more about your assessment. <laughs> yeah. So whenever... And how long did it take you to create and all that stuff? That's pretty cool. Yeah. It took me, I don't know, several months to do it and... So would, you, would you say it's very roofing specific for roofers from yes. what you went through with your dad? That's mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm measuring things like work-life balance. Okay. That's the first thing I wanna know is because, you know, back to our mission statement is wanting to create companies that are both profitable and fulfilling. So I do have roofing specific questions. Now I can easily adapt this to other industries, but you looking at your work-life balance Uh, measuring the effectiveness of your sales team, measuring the engagement of your team, and measuring, you know, what processes, like how effective are your systems. So it's it's pretty comprehensive there's there's 70 questions on there but that that's it that's an assessment on the entire company as a whole like on the company right. health, right right and then you do the individual assessments too so the individual would be like work-life balance that would be specifically for the owner or the leadership in the company but the interesting thing is i have the all the leaders in the company take this assessment and compare the results so awesome right so that way it's not just what's the issue it's now what are all the perspectives of what the issue is right because you think that everybody's on the same page and uh yeah we're going after growth but then you realize well this guy's going after growth but this guy wants to be home more and this guy wants this more and this guy right yeah so that's the first thing is get everyone on the same page then it's like instead of like conducting a meeting it's like okay what's important to you what do you think it's like no we're just going to take this assessment we're going to map out we're going to have a graph of what everyone thinks and so from there that conversation becomes powerful and productive wow and um how long does this whole initial before you actually come up with like a game plan how long does it take to really get there a long time. Yeah, no. probably like forever, no. right? No. You're always probably tweaking the game plan anyway, right? Right. So so the way we do it is we start with your initial assessment. Then we're going to move into the strategy piece. So that takes about three hours. So we're going to look at, we conduct a SWOT analysis, what went great and what hasn't been going great and what what are our biggest threats with our competitors. So we do a SWOT analysis and then we do goal setting. So we do that in a, in a really interesting way. So then we're working backwards. So a lot of times it's like, okay, we wanna, we're at 3 million, we wanna be at 10 million next year. So what do we need to do? Here are our problems, here's where we wanna go. Then we come in and create a custom plan of this is your action step. We break it down for each week. Over the next year, this is what you need to do to get there. 
So it's basically childproofing the roofing company. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Like really focused, really action oriented. So there's no guesswork anymore. So we are all on the same page that we know what the issue is. We're all on the same page where we want to go. Here's your plan step by step of where we need to go. Do you just do the year goal or do you do break it down? Because I like to do three month goals. So we, yeah, we do. So the whole gear plan, that's what we start with. And then we do quarterly check-ins. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I've got my team. Uh, it's three of us. Is it three of us? No, it's four of us now. And what we've got, I've got like, um, we're having a meeting every single week, but it's based on a three month timeline, like mm -hmm. 90 days. Mm -hmm. And we have just a, a bunch of like sales targets and, and claims that we want to sign and so on and so forth. But we evaluate it every week. Like how mm -hmm. many claims did we sign last week? How many, how much money did we bring in? Or, you know, how many, how much claim payouts? I also have like an Amazon store. How much did we have sales last week? And it, and how are we close to our three month mm -hmm. goals? What we do. And then I also have a whole list of a 90 day, our 90 day goals and what we want to accomplish in the 90 days. Yeah. You guys are on top of it. I read a lot. That's the problem. I probably read too much because what happens though with me, here's the problem with me though. And one of my assistants, Milan, he's just always on me about it is, uh, my goals change every week. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Is, we got to start. I, I write it down, but I have to give it to my other assistant to make sure we have it on there. I might even start using a, a um, like a whiteboard just to have it there all the time. But yeah, a little bit more organized, I guess. Yeah, I think that's awesome to be the visionary and, and as a leader, you should be. And then hopefully there's other people like um, your admin or other people on the team that say, OK, let's rein it back in. Right, right. So speaking of visionary, though, have you read Rocket Fuel? No, I've been I've been told that I need to do that. Yeah, I just finished that. What Rocket Fuel is about, and I want to get back to, to, to ownership too, but uh, what Rocket Fuel is about is every successful organization, multi-billion dollar organization, always has two people, has a visionary and an integrator. Mm -hmm. uh, the visionary is a person with all the ideas. You know, they see the vision, they can see where it's going, but they also have an integrator. And the integrator is actually, I actually, what I really like about the book is that the organizational chart, it's like here here and then it's everyone so it's your visionary it's your integrator and then the integrator is sort of like looking after everybody yeah and i would say that that's usually how it's set up with the roofing owner and then your operations manager gotcha and the operations manager is the one that makes everything happen and that's right. typically a woman in that position that's actually running the company interesting i've got tammy and tammy is a beast she um she is a she's quite the um what's the word i'm looking for she is she's very high in um oh i can't think of the word in, in just getting stuff done there's a word for it i'll think execution. about execution execution she's an executor yes that's the word yeah. i'm also high in execution as well but i'm also high i've got i've got like no brake pedal i'm all gas yes. you know thankfully she's and i'm very low attention to detail so for me tammy's tammy's works out really great because not only is she high execution which is very important uh she, visionary it's not not, not her thing nor is she high gas pedal she likes the safety net you know having you know having consistent income mm -hmm. and she's very very high attention to detail which is very important for me yeah that's super important um yeah so what i've noticed with so we've worked with eight companies we started it'll be a year next month good for you congratulations and every company has had one type so a woman in one position of leadership and power and that's what's made like their company even more successful, um, like that integrator position. Our co every company we've worked with, there has been a woman in this operations management role, um, but that's usually, and that's end up who I end up actually working with to pump out the systems that we create. So that's just, it's just interesting how that works out. Do you think women are just maybe more high attention to detail than men or am I generalizing? Um, I'm probably generalizing. No, I don't. I, I don't know that it's like it's that. I think it's. It could be the roofing industry itself too. You gotta have. It's just it's so male dominated, right? Yeah. The sales and team should. Be, I don't know though because one thing I am dying to do, and I'm actually I'm actually interested in having an all female. PA podcast. Mm -hmm. We need more female public adjusters because yeah. in our industry as public adjusters, it's very, it's very sales. You know, I mean, we're strictly paid commission. You know, that's what we're paid. We get paid when we 
when we not when we sign the claim we get paid when we get the claim paid you know so mm -hmm. it's it's tough because it's strictly commission you don't get any kind of salary but i think that women should be very good in sales positions and be able to convince yeah. people to sign that contract to sign on the dotted line you know yeah so I think that, yeah, like adding any type of diversity to a team. That's, Absolutely. That is where things, that's how you grow. You need new ideas, new perspectives, but we tend to hire like people that look just like us yep. and think just like us. Yep. And so that's what goes back to your culture of we want people to have the same values, but we, want, we don't want everyone to have the same opinion. Yeah. So <laughs> I have... It's me here in Tampa, born and raised in Miami. I have Tammy, uh, born and raised in Texas. Family is originally from China, lives in Wyoming. Milan, born and raised in Serbia, lives in Vietnam. And, and Ed, who lives in the Philippines. That's awesome. We've got the most diverse group, and that's really what I love so much mm -hmm. because you get different perspectives, you get yeah. different things. Uh, it's not always smooth though either, because when you get there, when you get people from different cultures and different things, you have to understand they've got like different personalities, mm -hmm. they've got different likes and dislikes, different styles. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But I think it, it only. I think you're right. I think it's only better for the actual culture for the business in general if you've got like some sort of diverse little things going on. You know? Yeah. I mean, when you think about like innovation, we don't like roofing is not like the most innovative industry here. So mom and pops, outdated technology, that's kind of where roofing is, it's really lagging behind. So I feel like, you know, the quickest way to, to growth is bringing in different skill sets into your company. That's why I like to do the strength finders assessment. Ah, that's the one I was going to get to eventually. Yeah, so yeah. everybody on my team takes the culture index mm -hmm. and the strength finder. Mm -hmm. And we finally just gave, uh, Tammy's already taken both. I already knew exactly what her chart was uh, from before. So I told you I would mention it before. You know, my good friend is uh, is Eric Wang. Eric mm -hmm. Wang is the owner of Ming Wang in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And he's got, geez, I don't know how many employees. He's got like hundreds of employees. And mm -hmm. he's been able to build teams based on all of their uh, culture index and strength finders mm -hmm. and he'll have the, the 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 sales division the leader in the sales division will have maybe similar characteristics because they're in sales but with the manager will have maybe a little bit more high attention to detail maybe a little bit more execution as opposed mm -hmm. to some of the other ones in the lower level so I find that right there that has changed my entire organization that culture index is just like incredible yeah, I think anytime we get outside of ourselves and can put data to our thoughts, right. like being able to measure things that aren't tangible. No, what's weird is when you know more about me <laughs> than I actually know about me. Yeah, so. I have conversations with Eric sometimes. And I'm just like, what? I'm like, yeah, that's me. Exactly what you're saying. And he's like, well, yeah, I know that because of your chart. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. I like that. You know, even when, like, I still continue to take assessments and want to learn more about myself because even though I'm a psychologist, I don't have the the ultimate, like, opinion of me. Like, I don't, there's still things that I miss. We have causes and conditions that cho that make us see ourselves in a certain light, but that may not always be true. Did you take, you've taken it yourself, obviously. The strength vendors, yeah. Have you had somebody, like... They, but you already know how to read it, right? You're right. Were so, you surprised at all by the results? Um, not really. Like, so I took like the top five strengths, and those all made sense from achievement and strategy. I was a little bit surprised that I thought I would be more like sales, more like influence. But mine was a lot in thinking, strategy, learning. Yeah, but so. that's good. Yeah. Well, you're a PhD, so you have to be high in learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but going throughout my business this past year, I'm like, man, like I really do need help with sales. Right. So right. I just want to go and educate and solve your problems. And it's like, you've got to get clients. Right. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And um, one thing I wanted to get into, I know we, we had some decent conversations in the last conference we went to. What do you think of the conferences? They're pretty cool, right? I Aren't think they're they awesome. Awesome. I like, I did a couple videos out there telling PAs, you guys have got to get out here, meet these roofers, meet these restoration contractors. Mm -hmm. If you're a roofer, meet the fellow roofers. Like it's just so much fun to talk shop and it's, everybody's mm -hmm. pretty laid back. I had a great time. It was my first time. 
It was? Yeah. What? I mean, I've been to conferences before, but I mean, it was my first time at a restoration conference. Yeah, I had a blast. I met so many cool people. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's how I've got most of my clients is that's at the awesome. conferences. So I'm still like learning how to do social media, but I highly recommend the conferences. So when the storm is coming up. Yep, that's the big so one. I'll be on the main stage. I'm the moderator for the women's leadership panel. I'm the keynote speaker. Um, and I'm going to be doing a breakout session on building culture. Nice. So what I like about uh, like the focus this year at when the swarm is education. So at some conferences, it's like, oh, we're going to go up there and we're going to sell our product. But it's really about education. Yeah. So I highly recommend you know, anybody in the industry or anybody that wants to go into the industry, you're going to meet a ton of great people and your thoughts are going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. You're going to walk away with something that it's like, oh, wow. I made this small change then our company could really be at the next level so, so you said you've been going to the conferences for a while mm -hmm. you've been in business for just over a well year. yeah so i guess a while right right, right right yeah so i actually started my so the reason how i like finally jumped into owning a business is that i was laid off on january 10th of last year and so i flew out to a roofing conference on january 11th nice my dad told me we were going on a, we were going on a ski trip. Lies. So I was like, okay, that's great. Then we get there, and he's like, oh, well, we're gonna spend three days at a roofing conference. And I'm like, what the hell, man? <laughs> okay, this is the last place I want to be. But actually, at the conference, I learned so much, and I'm like, man, like there's nobody doing what I'm doing in the roofing industry, and this is a huge opportunity for me. Did you already have an idea that's what you wanted to do, or did it just sort of pop pop into your head right then and there? No, I did not know that that's what I wanted to do. That's awesome. I knew I wanted to be in consulting. I've always wanted to have my own consulting firm. I've got, you know, I've consulted with over 13 companies before I came into roofing. But, and then just feeling, I just fell in love with the industry. It was Paul Reed's conference and so well done. And just meeting everybody and knowing, man, I know the value that I brought to my dad's life and know how putting systems in place and having the right leadership changed his life and changed my family. And I was like, just looking around, I'm like, I can develop a system and processes that, that can do the same thing for people. Right. And so I put the business plan together, started the business plan January 12th, picked up my first client at Win the Storm, January 20, or February 22nd and we've been busy ever since. That's awesome, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conferences are just like big time. You meet just so many people. I mean, that's the way to go, I think. I, I feel like, what have I been doing for the past 13 years? <laughs> Are you going to win the storm? Of course I'm going to win the storm. Okay. Yes, I'm definitely going. To, I'm excited about win the storm. People tell me that win the storm is just like off the chain. Like yeah. it's just like so many people and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, the one that we uh, that we went to was the SRC Summit. And what I liked about that one is that it was kind of, uh, it was very, you know, like exclusive. Like it mm -hmm. was, uh, it didn't seem like there was too many people, but I kind of liked that. I liked that it was like that because if not, I heard, well, what I heard about the win the storm is that it's just like, it's intense. It's super intense. How many people are we talking about? 2,000 plus. 2,000. Yeah. It's definitely the largest conference. So I think you get different things out of different conferences. Um, I mean, when I went to Win the Storm, that's where I got like so much energy and, and just feeling that intensity. I was like, it really feels like That's what I heard. I heard the SRC Summit is more like, uh, it's very, you know, intimate. You get to really know people. You get to really just sort of hang out, have some nice conversations with people. Uh, but the SR, but the uh, when the storm is 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 like just energy. It's like mm -hmm. igniting. Yeah, right? ignite right. results. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say that's accurate. And I think going to a variety of conferences and learning different things because there's always different speakers. It's there's one in Miami. When is that one? Roofing, roofing restoration, roofing. Storm, storm roofing, roofing storm conference, something like that. <laughs> okay. I looked it up. I looked it up recently. But yeah, there's one in Miami, but that's not until like May. Okay. Yeah. Well, I might have to make an appearance. You should probably make an appearance. Yeah. After this podcast goes out, I'm going to be famous. So. Not that many people listen to it. <laughs> I mean, it's a decent amount, but I don't know. Depending if we can get all this editing right, I don't know if that's going to happen for our first live podcast. I'm a little nervous, but at least the GoPro's going, so that's good. That one keeps shutting off, unfortunately. But, and that one I think is good. 
but I don't know. I think it'll be fine. Yeah. So, I'm going to get off topic. Okay. Yes. Look at how nervous you are. <laughs> hey, you told me. I feel like I'm in the principal's office. You mentioned yesterday that you are a uh, famous country music star. I'm not famous, but I, she's got a YouTube channel, people. I put some stuff out on YouTube. Yes. So I'm a singer songwriter. Okay. And what? Okay. No. What we need to do is go over the list of things that you don't do. I'm <laughs> cook. Put, I'm terrible. Right. You don't want me to cook. Look, there she is, guys. There she is. <laughs> What's Jessica up, Stoll. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. What are the list of things that you don't? So you don't cook. Uh oh. No. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm terrible at cooking. We don't want me to do that. Um, I'm not good at keeping up with receipts. <laughs> <laughs> like softball. No, I can okay. play soccer, but like sometimes hand-eye coordination's not not so good. Not so good. Gotcha. Anything like sewing, kind of like everything domestic. <laughs> were you? Did you say you were the youngest of your siblings? I'm in the middle. You're in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out where you get this drive. I mean, because it's very impressive, Jessica. I mean, like uh, college, master's degree, right? PhD. A PhD. I mean, working for such a great organization like mm-hmm. Publix. Now having your own business in a in a male dominated industry like roofing, it's mm-hmm. it's very impressive. Yeah. Oh, and wait, I forgot country music star. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you like, almost what? got me out of that. Yeah, and country music star. So tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. So I started. I was just started playing piano when I was seven. Okay. And ended up playing like classical piano. I wrote some songs. I sang in the nursing home. Cool. Because it's like a captive audience there. Right. I can imagine. And like, I was off key, but that didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because they couldn't really hear. And I'm sure they were grateful for you even being there and doing it too. New two songs. That's okay. Memory's bad. Repeat, repeat. Right. So that's where I got my start. And, um, but I was always kind of shy. So I didn't really sing out until I left Nashville. It's like even the homeless people are great singers in Nashville. So I was so intimidated. Right. But when I left and moved to South Carolina for my PhD, then I, I got some more confidence up and sang. And then, like, the real reason that launched my career is because <laughs> I don't know if you want to hear this story. Of course I do. Okay. Yes, please. Ah. I like stories. <laughs> so, so, my toilet overflowed, it flooded. It was on the second floor and it got down into the first floor. That sounds like a great claim, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think of when you say that. So, and the moisture meter guy that came over to check the right. mold samples, yeah. he was like, oh man, is your piano okay? I'm like, yeah. He's like, let me hear a few songs. I'm like, okay. And you, and you just played for him like that? Yeah. I was wow. like, cool. I was like, I can play you a song I wrote. He's like, That's awesome. He's like, my cousin owns a record company. He's like, you know what? Why don't you put five songs together in the next couple of months and we're going to go record an album. And that's what happened. Wow. So he paid for half my record. He became a manager, went on a small tour up in Indiana and it was awesome. So I, I love that experience. That's not, I don't feel like that that's what I'm built for. Right. I'm more like the songwriting aspect. Gotcha. So that's why I call myself a living room singer. Gotcha. It's like really, I like playing for me and my close friends and my family. And I sing karaoke every once in a while. I'm sure you do. Johnny Cash is like the love of my life. Okay. So, I mean, then I, I mean, obviously if, if you're going to, if you're going to play piano and you're going to sing in front of a a mold detector person after a loss like that occurs, uh, I could only assume that if I ask you to sing now a a little song, at least just doesn't have to be long, maybe a few seconds, 30 seconds or so of one of your songs or of something, maybe a little Johnny Cash. Uh, can we can we hear a little something? Um, okay. This is not this is not staged, by the way. No, it's definitely not staged. Absolutely not. Okay. I mean, I guess so. Go for it. What do you got? Let's see. Do you need a beat or anything like that? <laughs> are you are you gonna rap? I uh, know. I don't know. I don't know what do you need. Okay, for... I'll sing if you sing. Oh no, you don't want me to sing next to you. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> okay, I, I'll do some Johnny Cash. So. All right, let's hear it. I hear the train a coming, it's rolling around the bend. I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. I'm stuck in Folsom Prison, time keeps dragging on. 
That train keeps rolling on down to San Antonio. <laughs> wow. Jeremy, did you hear okay. that? Okay, okay, okay. Woo! Oh, that was awesome. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much for so doing I that. So I need a dinner. Oh, I got you. I got you. I'll okay. take care of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That was okay. pretty cool. Look at yeah. that. That's the, uh, well, the because first. Because that's the man in black. So Look at that. Yeah. If he was still alive, I would... I would be he, married to him. He's like your idol? Yes. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of like my business idol as well. Really? Okay. Really? I mean, he went in un- uncharted territory. So he actually recorded that song in a prison. So when you talk about like getting real and raw and like to the heart of everything you do, I mean, he held, he held nothing back. He told multiple presidents how he felt. He actually went over to um in war zones to sing for the troops so it was like so much courage that he had and so much originality i'm like man um that's who i want to be right it's just like him and people are like no elon musk and you know i'm like i want to be like johnny cash with you know very humble roots and then coming out to share his thoughts and ideas and his music and really focusing on the people and not just focusing on money. You know, having idols, and I don't mean like idols, like like worship idols, but having like idols like that, where mm-hmm. you could just sort of, you could, when you respect somebody that much and you know a lot about them, whether you've ever met them in person or not, then you read about them. I think it's, it's very important to sort of, you have that like, that like inner beast in you, that like inner Johnny mm-hmm. Cash, right? Like yeah. I'm sure every time you sort of think about that, right? Like what would Johnny Cash do right now? Or I don't feel like getting up, but I bet you Johnny Cash would get up right now and do this, <laughs> this and that. Yeah, I think it really it's helped in uh, like being in the male dominated industry. Sure. Cuz he didn't take shit from anybody. And like multiple people told him no, he didn't get signed to a record deal right away. I mean, there's a ton of rejection in music and there's also a ton in, of rejection being new in the industry. Um and so it's just like when stuff like that happens, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. What would Johnny Cash do? I got gotcha. like, That's a good saying. Yeah, I think you should totally. Yeah, that's what it like. Me, I like. Uh, I'm big on the on the motivational guys like uh, like David Goggins. You ever heard of David Goggins? Mm-hmm. He's just like a freaking wild animal. Like that guy, that guy was a Navy SEAL and he runs he runs like like ten miles a day and he did like I, I don't know like three hundred miles in like three days. Like he just does some like crazy stuff. And sometimes in the morning, I usually work out in the morning and there's every morning I pretty much don't want to get up. It's Sometimes I'm like, what would David Goggins do? He'd be like, fuck you, put them on, put the shoes on, lace them up, let's go, you know? So, I mean, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good to have, like, uh, idols. Like, growing up, for me, uh, I was a big 49ers fan, San Francisco Mm -hmm. 49ers. Jerry Mm -hmm. Rice was my idol. And why was Jerry Rice my idol? Because that guy worked harder than everybody else, you know? He worked a lot harder than everybody else. He had a hill that he would run every single morning. In the off-season, he'd be just, like, running and running and running and... And yeah, I think that's what it's all about. Having somebody else that you can look up to is, I think, very important. Mm-hmm. I was a 49, 49ers fan for a little bit. I think we all were, right? Because like the 80s there, like they were like, you know, like they were just really just winning all the time, you know? So although the 80s is too young for you, right? <laughs> I was too just old. thinking. Yeah. Um, uh, for me then. I was born in the 80s. Yeah. But. I was born in the 80s too. But I, I love the <laughs> I love the 49ers for for a bit and it's funny well 95 right yeah steve young steve young in 1995 so i had this like little book that i got at the library where you could email or you well there's no email it was not we weren't even (laughs) there was no email back then scratch that no you wrote letters into their fan club and i got all these like autographed pictures and yeah when i was uh when they went to the super bowl in 1995 against the san diego chargers it was in miami and my dad took me every single day to the hotel that they were staying at, the Hilton. I'll never forget, just to stand out there and get signatures. I still have the ball. I have a whole ball of That's all the awesome. signatures. Yeah, John Taylor, Bill Romanowski, all those guys. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I love, like, just like the discipline. And out growing up, I always played sports too. Right. And I think like that's like you know we can use sports analogies. In everything we do, it's like build your A team. Like, yes. We don't want any bench warmers, you know. So I played tennis my whole life. Played <laughs> college tennis. I'm getting to something here. I was also a tennis coach for 15 years. Oh wow. I taught kids from the age of six to 18 years old 
taught a lot of high performance kids as well. I did a lot of mental toughness training with them as well. Uh, we would always try to sort of the same thing, not culture, but we would try to give them, try to find what their purpose was, their mm -hmm. inner purpose, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because if they don't find that, you know, going out there grinding every single day, they're just going to get tired of it and they're going to burn out. Um, but we, I always tell, I used to get so upset at parents that used to take their kids out of tennis because they got in trouble for some reason. Like, I don't know, they got in trouble in oh, school yeah, or they got in trouble, yeah. whatever. Oh, we're going to take you out of tennis. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, that's the thing that you cannot. Yeah, they have fun out here when they, but they're learning so many, so many values that they're mm -hmm. learning by mm -hmm. participating in sports mm -hmm. that you, that you don't learn in school. Yeah, you know, I you agree. don't learn like when you have a good coach. You know, well, you're a coach, but like, you know, even sports coach. Oh, yeah. Pushing you to go harder and try more and stuff like that. Sports is, is huge. I think it's very important. Yeah. Yeah, I always, ever since I was little, since I was three, I was always in sports. Yeah. Your sports? <laughs> <laughs> what sports did you play? I did um, karate and soccer. Nice. Boys tackle football. Nice. I tried softball. That was a disaster. Yeah. Swimming, track. Did play tennis. I could see, yeah, but I could see the hand-eye coordination is not where, really where you want it to be. No, yeah. no, like, no. Mm -mm. Tackle football, huh? Mm -hmm. Girls tackle football? Boys tackle football? Holy moly. I was eight, yeah. Yeah, good for you. That's awesome. So I went by Jesse, so no one knew I was a girl, like, on the other teams. So. Was, what position did you play? Safety and halfback. Wow, so you were knocking motherfuckers out. That's yeah. pretty good. That's awesome. I mean, it was six, seven, eight-year-olds, and I was eight, so I was kind of like one of the bigger people. Right. But still, it's like yeah, I would yeah, I would be jumping, like tackling people, and so you're perfect for this industry. Obviously, <laughs> you're perfect as I think an so. you're perfect as an entrepreneur too. I mean, it's very entrepreneurship. I mean, you know, I mean, you've got your days, right? Yeah, you've got your days that are just like. Uh, I don't know, like you want to give up sometimes. I know I get like that sometimes. It's just like, man, this is just too hard. There's too much work. Mm -hmm. And it's and it, sometimes it gets to a point where it's absolutely exhausting. Yeah. So, I mean, I learned so many lessons this past year. I can imagine. And yeah, there has been days just like, oh my gosh, like I've talked to 10 people. Nobody wants to work with me. Right. I could have. Yeah. And I it's bet. like. I bet. At first, it's like, man, like, I took it very personally. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm not, like, a, g a good person. I don't offer value. Mm -hmm. But it's just kind of, I think it's either <laughs> not the right fit or I'm not communicating my value in the best way possible. But like you said, that's why it's very important if you have if to stick with your purpose and your meaning and the reason why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's other, if it wasn't for that, I would have quit. Because this is not, like, when you're new in this industry it's like good old boy like everybody has been around for a long time my competitors have been around like 15 years i'm coming in just brand new in the industry even though i have a lot of industry experience people don't know my face so it's just like oh you know i've got like what is somebody with a phd even doing here or you don't know anything like but it's like after people like give me the chance to talk to them for 10 minutes it's like okay yeah we actually need you so. How big is your team? Is it just you? I have one person right now. Okay. Operations person. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So the integrator? <laughs> she, yeah. So I say I run the business and she runs me. I mean, we need it. Basically. We can't do everything. Yeah. And hopefully I'll be expanding my team next month. So definitely have some pretty exciting things in the work. So. So I can relate to all this stuff because I didn't I didn't know Eric was doing some of these things until recently. I was doing everything myself for probably 10 years. Yeah. And it's why I never really expanded to where I want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Now it's starting, right? At least I know everything there is to know about the industry, so I feel like I'm good there. I'm educated in what I need to do, but running a business and knowing about your industry are two completely yeah. different things. Yeah. Absolutely. We need we need coaches. Yeah, I have a coach. Do you? Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I Yeah, so I help companies write their mission, vision, values, and strategy. I had somebody help me with mine, and then I, and then I have a weekly coach because my thinking is not is very skewed depending on, you know, different, like, oh, I signed 10 clients, I'm the best, or no one wants to work with me. Like, my self, you know, opinion can go up and down the first year of business, it's very volatile. So, you know, having a coach to remind me, even though, like, you know, I outlined what's important to me, 
but I have a coach that helps remind me and pulls me back. Right. So you look at the most successful people, they all have coaches. We need one. Exactly. Um, what was I going to say? What are some of the most successful people that you actually look at? And you're just like, okay, is there an example that you use when you're like coaching a client and you're talking about organization, or you're talking about culture and stuff like that? Is there a particular example that you use? Like when I told you about the Miami Heat? Um, I mean, I usually like when I'm talking about culture, I usually just refer to Publix where I worked for so long. That's a great with, example. Like the hands-on experience. Yeah. Um, but when I work with clients, like what I really want to do is start with a blank slate, right? And not come in with anything that's like could taint their opinion. It's really like let's start from scratch and let's get to know you, and and going forward use what's important to you, right? So that's like co- coaching and consulting are are two different things, and we use both styles at Ignite Results. But coaching, like a lot of times, people will have the answers for like themselves they kind of know what they that's want that's so true that's so, so true well they know what they want and then they then they yeah when they get their personality assessments and stuff like that they're just like oh yeah that's right oh yeah that's true yeah so i always yeah with coaching it's it's a lot of people have the answers for their lives and themselves consulting they may not always have the answers for the business well what's the difference Wait, so coaching is more of a one-on-one, consulting is for like an entire organization? Right. Gotcha. Yeah, Yeah, so coaching, that's, I mean, you can coach different people in the organizations, but coaching typically happens one-on-one with the owner. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, we still got people watching. Look at you. Look at that. Famous. Okay, so coaching is more with the owner. Is it it like a, a package deal, or do people sort of get one or the other? Yeah, so I mean, what we're doing is we typically work for 90 days together with weekly calls. Okay. And so we're talking about consulting and and building systems, but during that time, it's we're coaching one-on-one of, you know, what's so this process is changing. How is that making you feel? Like what are you doing to like handle the stress in this? Cuz anytime when you say growth, that equals stress. So that's what it used to. That's the way I used to think of it. Right. I mean, well, but growth equals change. Right, if you put the right pieces in place, though, growth can happen while you still are happy. Yeah. But so stress doesn't necessarily mean you're unhappy. So okay. st- stress just means that it's, um, it's going to take energy from you. Right. And things are going to be unknown. So okay. it's change. So okay. growth equals change, and change causes stress. So you can now what you do with do with that stress is make turn that energy into something really positive, and so in that way, you know, growth can be positive and, and life changing. But growth and change, and you and comes to stress, and you freak out and you shut down, then we've got a huge problem. So. I think it's great that, you know, sounds like that you've done a really good job of like <laughs> it, when you're growing, being able to like handle everything and, but not everybody in the industry can, uh-uh. is necessarily like that. No, I mean, you mentioned something actually interesting that, what is it? That stress doesn't actually mean that you're unhappy, that you're unhappy. Mm-hmm. Right. So like, I think I am, I think you're right. I, I'm pretty happy, content, mm-hmm. uh, but I am very high stressed. That is true. Yeah. So stress is mainly your mental energy, right. mental and physical energy that's being taxed. So, so it depends on, you know, how you respond to that. What are some, are there any like, like quick suggestions that you can give to me without getting too much into in depth, I guess? Is there like little things that you can tell me to do? Yeah, I mean, so I can tell you a couple of things that have worked magically for me over the past year. Well, okay. really, I've been getting a PhD. That's high stress too. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but so starting in the mornings, like having a morning routine is something that's definitely kept me on track. So I do meditation five to 10 minutes a day, nothing like magical. It's just like setting my intention for the day, understanding who I want to be. That way when stress hits, I'm like already conditioned to respond in a way of peace and happiness and openness. I love meditation. Otherwise, we just get the day going and our natural 
conditioning in a world with more, better, faster in America. That's it. It doesn't stop. So unless we are intentional about starting our day off and really realizing what's important, we're automatically going to default to the more, better, faster, bad stress type of outcome. What about gratitude? Yeah, absolutely. So and do you journal? Mm hmm. So do I. Not as much as I want to. Right. But yeah. So I've got this journal. It's called the Best Self Journal. With Mike Bear. I don't know. Is that his name? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I know exactly. I, I met him. Oh, really? He was at a roofing conference. The day that I started See, my business is the day I listened to him. And he was the one that encouraged me to start my business. So his book, the way it is, is you've got, it's again broken down to three months. And he says the reason is, is because over three months, they've done studies apparently that goals that are over three months are just, you could have a year goal, that's fine, but yeah. you need to break it down into three months. Right. Uh, so you've got, so he does, uh, in the beginning of the book, you write, uh, and, and the book is very complicated, let me tell you. Like, like not the book, like the actual journal, you have to like really read the instructions before you start using this thing. It's the best self journal, it's awesome. I've already gone through four of them. And uh, in the beginning, you have three goals. They, he wants you to do one work goal, one health goal, and one personal goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have your goals and you break them down. You have the one goal up here, but then you break it down into three. And then you break those three, each of them down into their own subcategories, just different mm -hmm. things on how to sort of get there. Yeah. And then the whole thing is basically, um, I love it because the reason why I originally got it was all I wanted was I really just wanted the uh, like the weekly checklist thing. So what you do is you have like your whole week. Like for me, for instance, it's mm -hmm. uh, exercise, eating healthy, sign claims, uh, what else? Reading and like something else. And then I put on the next to it seven days for the whole week or five or six or stuff like that. And then every at the end of every day, I check off if I did it or not. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the week, I give myself like a grade, like a percentage. That I liked was cool. Uh, but then every week you sort of fill out what's your goal for the week, what's your three goals for the week, and what is it you're trying to hit. And then every day you wake up in the morning and you write down your whole schedule for the day, all the things that you have to do. He tells you you want to fill the whole thing up. Uh, you could write, I write down, I write down uh, all of my affirmations. I write down a bunch mm -hmm. of affirmations. And then uh, three things that I'm grateful for. I remind myself of my three goals and then I go on with my day. At the end of the day, I get home, I uh, finish my day, I'm in bed, basically about to go to sleep, and I write down what was my big win for the, for the day, mm -hmm. uh, what could I have done better, like learning experience, and then I write down my three things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. And it works fantastic. Yeah. Let me tell you, you get, you get shit done. Yeah, I should probably try that. I mean, it's I, awesome. I have everything in my calendar and do my journaling, but I think having it all in one place could be really powerful. Yeah, it, it works. I haven't done it in the past two weeks only because we've been moving and I can't freaking find it anywhere. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I strongly recommend it to everybody. I actually wanted to do a YouTube video just about that book. So tell me about him. He's probably pretty awesome. Yeah. So I think it's the same author, like best self is Mike Bear. And I don't know. I he was a like coach Google on it. Dr. Phil. Okay. So that's how he got his start. Okay. Um, and he spoke at um, Kim and Paul Reed's conference okay. out in Colorado. Okay. And he's super inspiring of like looking at when you're at your best, these qualities come out. Sure. And you have to give that a name. So, yeah. Johnny Cash? <laughs> that okay. I'm trying to remember what I named it. No, it was something more like sparkles or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And, and, oh no, I think it was joy. Sparkles and joy. I think that's what it was. Okay. And then it's really funny. So at my worst, like different qualities come out, like whether it's like trying to control people or um, taking things too personally. So at that conference, I named this side of myself, Cynthia. And so now I have friends, that, and I told them about this. So they're yeah, like, acting like just mean or something. So like they're that. like, oh, this must be Cynthia. Ah, the alter ego. So actually, yeah, that's funny. That's where it came from. It's putting two to two to two and two together now. Look is that, that they're like, oh, Cynthia. I feel like people on this podcast are going to be coming up to me. Sparkles. Sparkles. Or Cynthia. Yeah, exactly. Sparkles. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is awesome. Um, what about books? I'm guessing if you're high learning, you read a lot. Mm-hmm. Or not really. I feel like after my PhD, I kind of burn out, though. No. So I'll, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Like, what are some that you would recommend? It's something that I've been wanting to ask more guests. Yeah. Just for so, me. I don't care about anybody else. This is for me. The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. That's a good one. That's Mark Madsen or something mm-hmm. like that, right? That's I think he's one. great. I think Radical Acceptance Ooh. Um, by Tara Brock. I really like her. Um, just take on things so it's about instead of like when things come up that like trigger bad emotions instead of just running from them actually being able to um, comfort yourself in those moments right so I really like that um anything else what am I reading now I'm reading superfood outliers outliers is fantastic yeah I'm going back to that one but I'm mainly using that as like a sleeping mechanism. Oh so, no, don't say I love, that about I love the Malcolm. Book. I know, I love the book. Oh, but dare you. I do. So, but now I'm going back through it and now I'm just like reading a couple pages and trying to go to sleep. Yeah. That's bad, I'm sorry. No, it's not because I mean, I think it helps It helps me too. I try to get through as much as possible but eventually, yeah, it makes you tired and it makes you want to go to sleep. Do you have a Kindle? No. You should get one, it's the best. I like paper. But then you have to have the light on. I know, but it's, I mean, I feel like just like the the no. screen on the technology, isn't that going to like mess up your Right, eyes? the Kindle, the Kindle is special. Kindle has a feature where, and I, actually my phone has it now too, uh, but the Kindle has a feature, you put it on dark mode, Ooh. and it turns black, and, it, and the letters are just like this off-white. Oh. Oh man, go right to sleep. It's like a it's like a lullaby. Man, my whole life is changing in this podcast. Get the Kindle, I'm telling you, the Kindle's the way to go. That also and the Kindle you can also read uh, out in the sun. So like okay. if you read have you ever read a book on your phone? I no. I that's all I, I used to just read all my books on my phone. I'm old school. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the Kindle you can read like right in the sunlight. But no, yeah, get the book, no, no way. You know what I do do? Do do is <laughs> I actually buy I'll I'll buy the book on Kindle, I'll read it, and if I want it for like a little library, I, I also buy the hard copy too. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. Yeah, it is ridiculous. I yeah, know. you're wasting your money. I know, but it's nice because I don't know, we're trying to do a little library in the new oh. house. You know, have like a little nice bookshelf with some nice yeah. books and stuff. And uh, you know, I, I can't put my Kindle up there, it's not gonna look right, you know? Yeah, I use books to decorate. Yeah, exactly. They look nice. Mm-hmm. But still, you should have books. And people are like, oh, wow, interesting book. Did you read this? Hopefully you did. And if you didn't, that's okay, too. Yeah, just uh, read the Cliff's Notes. Right. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> All these books appear I've read. Right, exactly. So what's the plan now? Now that you've got your first year under your belt, uh, what's the uh, what's the plans? What do you want to do? What are what are your goals? What's your what's your three what's month your goal? And what's plan? your one year plan? You ask this question all the time, so now I'm asking it to you. So, I mean, I started January, February, and March. Is I wanted to sign on four clients. Okay. And so halfway, well, two so far, and maybe three by the end of the week. So. So okay, sorry, because I was doing all this crap. Okay. So you said what? What's the you want to sign on how many? Four. By March. March. Mm-hmm. But that was your goal at the beginning of the year. Right. So three month goal, four new clients. Right. Gotcha. And we're already at, already at two and hopefully three bed. What was the what path? I, I know there's a path. You have your four goals or you have your goal for your three month. What's the path that you were trying to take? What were some of the things, some of the things that you wanted to do to make sure you would get there? Yeah, so like building out, making sure I'm posting on social media every day, which I'm not great at social media. Hire a virtual assistant for that. Okay, so you're changing my life over here. I'm gonna get a Kindle, hire. virtual assistant. It's very easy, because uh, I tell in our course that we do, I tell the people all the time. I, I actually tell them, I tell, here's how I go. I tell them, okay, you have to do, you have to post on Instagram. You have to post on Facebook. You have to post on LinkedIn. You have to design your own posts. You have to schedule your own posts. You have to do this. And they're all just looking at me like, dude, I'm not gonna do that. And then at the end, I go, hire a virtual assistant. Hire a virtual assistant. If you want to hire one in the U.S., that's fine. Uh, Jeremy's always laughing at me because I like to hire abroad, obviously. And uh, honestly, for 10 bucks an hour, for 10 hours a month, yeah. how, much, how much do you need? If you've got content, you do have to come up with the content, but if you've mm-hmm. got content, 
they could schedule everything out and you are going to be in people's faces every single day. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of why I brought on my operations assistant is so she can write the content and post it. Yeah, but she's going to be burnt out eventually too. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Sorry. Go, go, go. Okay. Okay. So posting on social media and then attending conferences. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of prep to, for when the storm, which is, are you going to have a booth? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yep. was thinking about it. I should get a booth, right? I think so. I just don't have anything. I don't know. I don't have anything tangible right now. I'm not doing it. Yeah. I mean. You've got everything running already. Yeah. I've got my claims and stuff, but our commercial claims advocate stuff, which is like all the educational stuff. Mm-hmm. We're not. We're not there yet. Yeah. I mean, it's expensive. Yeah. When the storm booths are, are pretty expensive. Yeah. Um. So, my goal is like for the client piece is to social media, I've been networking a lot, like Mm -hmm. calling other people that aren't contractors. So like you're in my network, yeah. Like three or four public adjusters and they've referred me to business. My one client I got because my friend Doug in the APA said, this is perfect for you, go ahead. Doug doesn't know it, but he's gonna be my next guest. Really? Yeah. He's probably the best person I that I know. He hates insurance companies. It's great. I know. Yeah. He sees he sees the BS that they're full of. Yeah, I would say Doug Quinn and his wife Heather are awesome rock stars. Great incredible. People. And Doug is so passionate. I love that. I love passion. Yeah, I think they're awesome. I mean, plus they like. You know what I love that about the conferences too that I get a kick out of is like there's like some uber successful people at these conferences. Am I right or wrong? Mm-hmm. And they've all got like really interesting stories, right? Yeah. Like, like Phil's story, the attorney, did you remember, you remember yes. him? Yes, yeah. Like he was like in a coma and stuff and his daughter had gotten in that bad accident. Exactly. And he thought that she was dead and then she came back and he got out of a coma like that. Like that story right there was like, I'm not getting into too much details because I don't know if I should or not, but and I I don't know the details like like details like he does, but and he's also a pretty successful dude, you know? Yeah. But it didn't come easy for him either. You know, yeah. a lot of things that I noticed meeting these people at these conferences was like, you know, they weren't they weren't handed this to them. No. Did you hear Scott Rypol's story? I heard. I heard uh, that, well, I didn't hear his story. If you can get into it just really quick, that'd be awesome. Yeah. But I heard it was like the story of the conference. It was, yeah. He was in jail. Yeah, he was in federal prison. Right. And he was making deals, selling, making sure all of his bills were paid and why he was in a prison cell, <laughs> using all his uh, time to be calling and still like selling. And, That's amazing. Yeah, so he, I mean, he got in a lot of trouble you know, selling drugs and just a lot of like criminal activity, had a rough upbringing, dropped out of school in eighth grade um, and got involved with the wrong people. And like, and then he started, he entered the roofing industry, was super successful, went to prison, came back, hired a lot of the people he went to prison with. Wow, that's awesome. Started the roofing company and he's, I think number four, contractors in the US for yeah. volume. Yeah. So his story is incredible. He's in recovery. Um, just like it, anybody, he's got the biggest heart. Yeah. So I, I saw just like contractors, like several just like tearing up, like, man, if this guy can come with such like challenges and now look where he's at, then I mean, that, that gives people hope. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not easy. It's never easy. Never. So to anybody who's still listening at this point, it's not easy. Like if you think that you need to give up now, it's just you got to keep going no matter what. Yeah. And it's no offense to my PhD uh, interview guest here, but it's not about really how quote unquote intelligent or smart you are or anything like that. I think that has a lot to do with it, but it also, it's really just grit. Oh, another good book, by the way. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Grit, you heard of that? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a good book. Uh, it's all about grit. It's all about your determination. It's your hard work and you being able to get up in the morning and get after it, you know? Yeah, I would say that's how I got my last. So I signed, I ended up signing a client at SRC, but it was the last day. It's raining outside. I'm like, already went back to my hotel three times. I was like, I need to talk to this person. I need to show them what's on my laptop. So I was like, one final hike back over to the conference center. 
and that's when that's when <clears throat> I met the person, walked him through everything, and we signed this week. So nice, nice. So you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah. Little, right. Is yeah. your what's your dad say? Is he proud? Oh yeah. He's kind of like <clears throat> he's embarrassing because he thinks I'm the best thing in the world. It's like I don't know if you ever see on soccer games where like the parents with the big signs. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, he's so somebody was talking to one of my competitors at SRC, and my dad comes over. He's like, "Excuse me, she's better." I'm like, oh my god! No, he didn't. Yes, he did. I'm like, oh my god! He didn't care. I met your dad. I did. He's the happy guy. He does not seem like somebody who would have a stroke because of stress. Yeah. He seems like such a chill guy. Is it because of the stroke? <laughs> He's definitely chilled out after that. I mean, I was actually having a long conversation with Doug Quinn, and he saw Doug, and he, you know, he said, what's yeah. up, Doug? Doug introduced me to him, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have her on the podcast. He's like, oh, that's great. Uh, but he's so chill. He's super nice. I mean, you've seen him at a conference. It's like when somebody's, like, away from the stress of work. Yeah. And I don't want to say he's not chill, but... Actually, no, he's like super high strung. Well, here's the thing. It's like, it's sort of what happens to me. I'm actually, I'm pretty chill, pretty relaxed guy, but it's us who are chill that any little thing, it gets us off of our, if we're off of our chill, <laughs> it sucks, you know, and it gets us very stressed. Yeah. I hate, I don't like being stressed. It really stresses me out. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, after my dad like built the systems and put the right leadership in place, he's definitely much more chill and like stress is leveled out for sure. Right, right. Good stuff. Well, I mean, I think we're good here. I mean, I don't know. 